Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the um, last lecture contributing to the webinar series on climate impact attribution, which is held in the context of the Proclius cost action and also supported by the EasyMap activity. Um, I've been hosting uh, this webinar series together with Veronika Huber, who unfortunately is not able to um, join today, but she, of course, also would have been looking forward to this contribution um, by Luke Grant, which I would like to introduce you quickly. First of all, I must say that I'm really excited to have Luke here today um, to present some of his work on attribute of global, global lake system change to anthropogenic forcing in a study that was um, uh, published, I believe, in Nature Geoscience or Climate Change, I can't remember, um, not so long ago. Um, Luke Grant is currently a doctoral candidate at VUB. And with this, I only can say that I'm looking forward to the contribution of Luke, and I'd like to give the floor over to you. Hi everyone, uh, thanks Lucas for the introduction. I guess you saved me a little bit of breathing space there. Um, yeah, my name is Luke. I'd just like to thank the organizers for allowing me to present our community's work here, um, which is titled, like Lucas said, Attribution of Global Lake Systems Change to Anthropogenic Force. So to brief you on the significance of lakes, for those of you uh, maybe not aware, lakes are special because of their ecosystem services, which includes among many things, provision of water, uh, fisheries and recreation for a guy like myself. Um, but as well, they are these single point indicators of catchment health in that they integrate local environmental change and to this end, researchers for a while have called lakes sentinels of climate change. And this is because they, they buffer weather noise or synoptic scale variability, but their temperature column, ice cover and stratification are all sort of reflecting lower atmosphere conditions. Um, and so because they have these important offerings to us and they have a special way of uh, reflecting in a, a sort of a noiseless fashion how the climate is behaving. The idea of finding if they have been significantly changed by climate change is worthwhile. And so this is what the objective of our paper was. And we try to do this with physical lake characteristics. And you might ask why this is uh, important to some of those ecosystem services, which are kind of around lake biology. And the idea is simply that um, some of these physical lake properties like ice cover and in tandem lake temperature are foundational to the lake environments. And this is because, for example, with ice cover, uh, this acts as hopefully a consistent temporary barrier to things like heat, uh, oxygen, and particulate exchange, uh, which stabilizes lakes and um, provides this foundation to a lot of processes. So traditional lake studies um, use monitoring equipment like you see figured here. Uh, and based on one's own study lake, this sort of dictates their mode of data collection. As well, a, an individual researcher's history with a given model and its developments uh, and calibration means that they sort of find their own way in this path. And then in some studies in, in limnology, where for an individual lake, climate change projections have been undertaken, there's also then these individual choices um, about how you curate data to look at perhaps like the future evolution of your lake. Um, and what I'm getting at here leads to the benefits of ISMIP. Uh, which is that there's this site specificity which bounds your research. And um, that means when you get results for these climate change projections for an individual lake, um, across different lakes, 
different decisions might be made in that uh, timeline of research. And so results are not so compatible and comparable. And so this is of course where uh, ISIMIP, and for those who don't know, this is the intersectoral impact model intercomparison project becomes quite handy. Uh, to brief you on this, the idea is that researchers uh, who are specialists in running models for a given system that depends on boundary conditions from the atmosphere and from other drivers, like sometimes socioeconomic uh, aspects like population uh, or GDP, uh, that they buy into the notion of using consistent ensembles of curated input data. And that means you get a better compatibility of results and a number of benefits that you see in the right-hand column of this flow chart from an early stage of this MIP. So we are, of course, working in the lake sector uh, to do this analysis with ISMIP data. And the lake sector has both local and global lake simulations. The local simulations uh, in ISMIP stage two span around 60 lakes. Uh, and these are calibrated runs where you have sufficient observations to um, calibrate lake models. However, in our analysis, because we're, as you can see in the title, trying to make global statements about lakes, we use the global lake simulations. And these can be kind of understood as follows. So there is this set of uh, atmospheric input data from climate model simulations. Um, and for each pixel in the bias corrected uh, atmospheric data field where a real lake exists according to some background data that we all agree on, we simulate lakes in a spatially distributed manner. Um, these are of course uncalibrated. So in my mind for a given individual lake versus a calibrated run, the quality is going to be much lower but the trade-off that we poise for is honestly um, that we then get to look at how generic lakes might behave in climate domains where we don't have data for calibration. Um, so these simulations are producing physical lake properties like a column of lake temperature and uh, thickness of ice cover. And one example is from a land model, which has a lake model subroutine, CLM 4.5. Uh, and it's forcing from one of the GCMs uh, involved in ISMIT 2. So this is water temperature at two meter depth evolution in the future period for RCP 6.0. Um, and you can imagine that, as I'll show later, that we have multiple lake models and uh, multiple global climate models forcing them, that we will have multiple of these lines and get to look at uh, uncertainty in future lake projections. Now, our analysis then kind of contains two questions, uh, which are, let's say, historically based and then based in the future. And these are about lake ice cover, and I call them near surface lake temperatures, but these are around two meters in depth. Um, so the first question is, have we pushed lakes from the natural states? And the second is, what is the future of lakes? The first is really a question of detection and attribution. Uh, so the theme of this series of webinars. And in some sense, we're hybridizing these different definitions of detection and attribution. Um, the working group one definition involves seeing if atmospheric characteristics have been changed by changes in climate forces. And the working group two definition of impacts is rather seeing how natural systems uh, have been impacted by climate change. So there's sort of along different ends of the causal chain. I say we hybridize this because we're using climate change attribution definitions, but we're looking at lake impacts. Um, so here, detection is defined as asking if observed lake shifts are unlikely under internal climate variability, meaning are they changing outside the bounds of what is natural according to climate noise? If you can detect the change in lakes, you can attribute this to anthropogenic climate change by showing that these shifts are then also uh, consistent with an expected response to anthropogenic warming uh, or simulated response to anthropogenic forces. In addition, you have to technically show that this uh, change in observed lakes is also inconsistent with some other plausible explanations. And this I'll get into in detail because 
we didn't technically manage this, um, but generally this means that you additionally compare your lake changes uh, with changes from a simulation showing only natural historical forcings like volcanic and solar activity. So this leads again, as I just mentioned, to a couple problems. Uh, the first is in our attribution style. In ISMIP 2B, which is the phase of ISMIP, which we did our analysis in, we had the following experiments run by five lake models forced by four global climate models. So the first is a pre-industrial control, which spans the whole time span of all available experiments, so 1661 to 2099. And lakes simulated under this climate are showing how lakes might behave in a pre-industrial climate and uh, under internal climate variability. The second experiment is historical from 1861 to 2005. And then finally, we have different radiative forcing scenarios playing out in the future period. So as I've just described, strict attribution would require a couple things. First, we would need to isolate the anthropogenic impact on lakes as the difference between a historical simulation and then a historical natural simulation. Um, like I said a moment ago, this would be something which only has the influence of volcanoes and solar activity and other natural forces. So you would then want to show that there's consistencies between your observed lake changes and the way that the anthropogenic effect is playing out, as well inconsistencies between the observations and the stats. So our caveat is that in the stage of ISMIT that we worked on, ISMIT 2, we did not have this historical natural simulation. So what we have to compare is observed shifts against simulations with all historical forces. Our argument in our paper, which is probably fair and a good assumption, is that as a long series of detection attribution papers have shown that anthropogenic emissions dominate other forcings in historical climate change, showing consistencies between observed shifts and simulations where we know that these forcings are dominated by anthropogenic influences is pretty good evidence of attribution. So our second problem in our study is a set of observations. As I've said already, we want to make global statements about how lakes are changing. And as you probably gathered from the detection and attribution definitions we're working with, um, we need both a look at how lakes are changing in observations and how they're changing in simulations. Uh, however, getting lake observations that span the whole earth is a bit difficult. You could start with looking at in situ lakes or databases taken in situ. Um, at the top is one for lake ice from the Global Lake and River Ice Phenology Database. And you see that, well, these are not so nicely spatially distributed in the Northern Hemisphere. We have a lot of lakes in Scandinavia, uh, as well as some spanning the border of Canada and the US. And then if you look uh, to the in situ brown points in the lower panel, uh, we have a similar kind of bad spatial distribution of these lakes. Now, these generally have a long temporal span. So the data series can kind of capture climatology and are good for looking at trends, but we can't make global statements with them. Alternatively, there are satellite observations. And these do cover a lot of the Earth and probably enough to make confident statements about how lakes are changing. But in an inverse way, they are also a new tool to us as researchers. So we can't really use them for a 30 to 50 year time series, which spans the climatology and which allows us to rule out the effects of internal climate variability. So the second catch in our paper is that we substitute true observations with reanalysis. For those of you who don't know, reanalysis is essentially a reconstructed historical atmosphere where a coupled simulation is using uh, true observations as these anchor points to bias correct it. And in a newer version uh, or a newer reanalysis product, ERA5 land, um, this reconstructed atmosphere is used to compute a diagnostic with an uncalibrated lake model. So this is using F-Lake to produce uh, offline lake simulations um, from the reconstructed atmosphere in the reanalysis product. And this lets us fix a couple issues with true observations. 
Um, for one, at the time of the study, this spanned 1981 to 2019. So we have a good number of years here to work with. And number two, as you see in the figure, uh, this has a complete spatial coverage according to some background lake mapping data set. So this is kind of our option for detection attribution. To briefly review it as well, um, I'm showing you three out of four variables that we attribute or that we attempt to attribute. Uh, in the left panel is ice onset, where blue colors mean that the date of ice onset for lakes is being pushed further into the year. And you see that generally there's moderate changes in ice onsets to go later uh, with some stronger ones in Eastern Europe. In the middle panel, we have ice breakup, where in northern latitudes, you see that the most severe ice breakup is happening, as well as in some other places. And then there's a bit of an absence of a signal where I'm at right now in Eastern Canada and uh, the US. And these effects, of course, uh, compound together to produce greater changes in the historical series of ice duration. And just to bring you back to the question of detection and attribution, um, the idea here is that we ask, are these changes significant relative to internal climate variability? So the fourth variable that we attempt detection and attribution on is annual changes in lake temperatures simulated in the reanalysis products. Um, but here I show an image of these temperatures broken down season-wise for the same period and the same delta. So here you just get to see that, that historical lake changes according to the reanalysis product are most severe in the summer season and in northern latitudes. So I first should describe a little bit how we get into our detection question, how we address this. Um, this starts with a null hypothesis, which we, of course, uh, hope to break. And that is that uh, leak signals in the reanalysis product here in five land are indistinguishable from internal climate variability. So here, the signal form that we look at is, sim is simply a global mean time series. And this is not always the case in climate change attribution studies because signals are not always so coherent. Uh, but since lakes strongly reflect atmospheric warming, we get to do this. Um, as well, lakes under internal climate variability, as I described earlier, come from our ISMIT pre-industrial control simulations. The idea here is that because we have 20 um, climate model, lake model combinations, and each of these has hopefully hundreds of years of pre-industrial control runs, uh, we take from this data as many possible realizations of pre-industrial lake behavior that match the length of our observations. Now for most variables, this is around in this study, 120 lakes. Um, and this acts as a sample against which to compare uh, observed changes. And then as well, we have the expected response to anthropogenic forcing. Uh, which was described in my definitions for detection attribution. And that is here taken as the ISMIP historical simulations for 1981 until 2005. And then we concatenate this with ISMIP future simulations of lakes uh, from 2006 to 2019. Uh, yeah. So this is not an actual set of results, but just some dummy data and a sort of template to show you the distribution approach that we take to comparing observed lake shifts with pre-industrial control lake behavior. So we take all of these iterations of pre-industrial lake behavior that I mentioned in the last slide, and these form a distribution uh, or the null distribution for a test. Our test statistic is then the signal form of area five land. And of course, if we see that they're consistent, then we cannot reject the null hypothesis. But if we see some distinction between the behavior of ERFI land and the pre-industrial control lakes, then we can reject our null hypothesis and make some claims about detecting a signal, which opens up for attribution. Now, in terms of attribution, we do a sort of classical detection attribution approach called optimal fingerprinting. The idea here is effectively that you regress your observations onto model responses to different forces. So here we have Y as our reanalysis, X as our historical simulation of lakes, 
And the solution to the regression is essentially in this 1D case, a slope value or regression parameters. And the regression parameters are what you use to make inferences on, um, on whether or not the signal is detectable in the observations. So if the regression parameter is overlapping with zero, meaning that if the single point plus or minus its confidence interval overlaps with zero, then the set of forcings affecting lakes in the model simulations um, are indistinguishable from material climate variability. But if they're greater than zero, we get a confirmation of detection from our distribution approach in the last slide. And then additionally, if these scaling factors or regression parameters overlap with one, we get to make statements about attribution. So like I mentioned here, we have this 1D case where we don't get to break down reanalysis as both um, historical and historical nat uh, historical natural, sorry. And so our slope outcome is sort of the result that I'll show in a couple slides. However, ideally, we would have two different simulations to compare our observations against. One would be the derived anthropogenic effect on lakes, and the other would be um, the historical natural effect on lakes. Now, these kind of mean different things based on us doing it in the way we did or uh, performing this with the ideal set of simulations or experiments that we didn't have. Um, in our case, what we're asking is how much are observations alike to simulations under all forces? Uh, and this is conferred by, again, the slope parameter. In the case where we would get to break down um, observations as a set of simulations, we would rather be asking, how can we decompose observations as a linear combination of simulated responses to different forcings? And we would see um, sort of what is the fractional uh, significance of a given set of forcings in the observations. And of course, we're doing the first one. So our results are, as you see here, uh, just to sort of introduce the figure in the left-hand column, we have this distribution or what we call a correlation approach in our study. Uh, in the top row, you have water temperature. Uh, the second row, you have ice onset and then ice breakup and ice duration. Um, in gray, we have a distribution representing pre-industrial control or uh, lake behavior under internal climate variability. But what we're actually doing here is taking correlations. So we have a historical multi-model mean series and we take a correlation between the single series and every iteration of pre-industrial controlled lake behavior. And this gives us our null distribution in gray. Um, we have a couple percentiles marked assuming a normal distribution, for example, the 95 and then the 99 in blue here. And then we have our test statistic, which is um, a final correlation between our historical multi-model mean series and the reanalysis product. Uh, and the position of this final correlation lets us know whether or not uh, lake behavior in our observations or the reanalysis is outside the bounds of internal climate variability. And in the case of this figure, it's our take that this shows a good distinction that we can detect significant changes uh, in lake behavior in the reanalysis product. Now in the right column, we have in insets the scaling factors or output of the regression from multiple fingerprinting. Uh, but in the background, we also just show time series. So in red, you have the historical multimodal mean time series. In black, you have the reanalysis or observations. And then in blue, you have um, pre industrial control behavior of licks. So this is something that Gabby Hegel uh, mentions in her study, or sorry, in her presentation at the start of this webinar, which was that, you know, there's, there's many methods by which you can show that observations are more like simulations with anthropogenic forcings than those without. And the simplest way to do this is just to overlay time series. And in some way that makes this figure very effective. Uh, for water temperature, you see that the observations um, 
don't have the same warming trend. And so model simulations have a bit of a warm bias. But at the same time, you see that they're clearly outside of the range of pre-industrial lake behavior. And so this confirms detection. For the other variables, you see that while in some cases, the observations don't have the same phase of variability as the historical multimodal mean series, which is understandable. Uh, they're different realizations of climate. They are in line in terms of their trends. Um, and so this is already kind of a look at detection and attribution. But then if we go specifically to the results in the insets or the scaling factors, you see that in every case, the scaling factor and its confidence interval is greater than zero, which means that we have a detectable signal in the historical series or the observations. Um, and then for three out of four variables, for all of the ice variables, we can additionally show that our observations are really consistent uh, with the historical simulations. So this, in our mind, is pretty good evidence of attribution. So in the second part of our paper, we go into looking at future projections of lakes. What I'm showing in this figure is uh, a set of deltas between a 30 year mean period in the historical series, something like 1970 to 2000, and then the final 30 year mean climatology in the future period for RCP 8.5, something like 2070 to 2099. In the top left panel, we have changes in annual mean lake temperature, where you just see unanimity in lake warming, uh, especially in temperate latitudes, it looks like lakes are projected to warm most severely. Things get a little more interesting in the right panel in panel B, where we take summer changes in lake temperature, but we scale them by global mean air temperature. And you see here that northern latitudes have a higher climate sensitivity for lakes. And then the bottom panels are familiar based on the sort of figure that I showed you for a reanalysis product. So, um, in the left panel, you have ice onset, which is uh, again kind of moderately changing on the order of 15 to 30 days in pushing uh, lake ice onset dates, or sorry, I'll say zero to 15 days mostly, in pushing lake ice onset dates further into the calendar year. But this gets worse for ice breakup. And as these compound and ice duration, we see really considerable changes in lake ice. Now, my favorite figure from the paper is this last one. Um, so this is looking at uh, global annual mean anomalies in lake temperature at the top row, ice thickness in the middle row, and ice duration in the last row. In the left column, I'm just showing time series. Uh, and because we have these 20 uh, lake model and GCM combinations, I show you these uncertainty bands to show the the, I think it's the standard deviation in potential lake outcomes for each experiment. Uh, so we have the historical series in black um, and all of these, all of these experiments are taken as anomalies relative to the pre-industrial control, which is in pink. So that's why they start at zero. Um, what's most important here is you see that for all variables, uh, radiative forcing choice in the future period is the greatest uh, dictator of uncertainty. So we don't see that uncertainty bands are overlapping so much, except uh, that this occurs a bit with ice thickness, so there's more uncertainty there. And in my mind, this shows the benefit of ISMIP. So we get to assess uh, the sort of full uncertainty of the ensemble. So then if I take these global annual mean anomalies, and I scale them against global warming since pre-industrial time, um, we get a global average look at a sort of damage function. So uh, this gives a linear relationship between changes in lake temperature, for example, and changes in global warming. And I plot here color-coded impact years to show the time for a given scenario when a given impact is reached. And this is very communicative, showing the difference between committed lake impacts for RCP 2.6 in blue and RCP 8.5 in red. Uh, as well, I think it's about 0 0.8 degrees of lake temperature warming for every degree of global uh, mean air temperature warming. Um, yeah. 
So as far as conclusions go for our paper, we sort of start with this historical period again. Uh, and this looks like historical changes are extremely unlikely to have occurred as a result of internal climate variability alone. As well, these lake changes are likely attributable to greenhouse gas emissions, but full confirmation of this result could still come. And this could occur by ISMIP-3 lake simulations, which will hopefully be done under the historical natural experiments. Um, as well, even further into the future, of course, this could be confirmed with a true analysis with an observational record, but this wouldn't be possible for quite some time, I think. Now, in terms of the future period, this is rather simple, which is the projections of lake properties show a clear dependency on radiative forcing scenario, which underlies the importance of mitigation for worldwide lake ecosystem health. And so that's everything for my paper. Uh, this is the sort of header of it and a DOI. If anybody has any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, and further, if you're interested in contributing to simulations or learning uh, how these simulations were done in ISMIC 2 and how they will be done in ISMIC 3, you can find this uh, paper in GMD for our group.